Okay, so hello and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Derek Horton. I co curated this exhibition with Alice Correa, of, of whom more in a moment. Um, <coughs> and it's really great to see you all here for what is the fourth of a series of six in conversation talks that we're doing in relation to the exhibition. Um, just to very briefly give you some context, I'm kind of guessing that most of you will, if not all of you hopefully, will have seen something of the show already. If you haven't, there'll be plenty of time after this to, to visit the exhibition this afternoon. Um, it's a show that for me, in a way, the history of it goes back 30 years because 30 years ago this year, in 1993, Jill Morgan left Rochdale, where she'd been the curator here since 1980, um, and she moved to Leeds, where she taught in the Fine Art Department, and indeed was the head of the Fine Art Department at Leeds Metropolitan University. Um, I'd just started working there about three months before Jill arrived, and we worked together for well over 10 years and it was my privilege to work with Jill and to learn a great deal from her. So in a way, the history goes that, back that far. In a different way, it goes back just five years or so, four or five years, when Mark Doyle became the director of Touchstones Rochdale and was very interested in the history of what had happened here, was kind of aware of it in certain ways but not in any detail. He knew that I'd worked with Jill and, and had that connection. Um, and he and I had a conversation in a cafe in Hebden Bridge um, sometime in, I think, 2018, may even have been 2017. And we are now where we are. Um, and that's a long story, and I won't for a moment start to tell you that story, except for a very brief part of it, which is that a, a few years after that first conversation, Mark and I met Alice Correa, who's going to chair this afternoon's talk. Um, Alice is an art historian who researches and writes primarily about South Asian artists from the 1970s, 80s, um, and other things beside, but I guess that's probably the main focus. Um, and Alice's edited anthology, What is Black Art, has just been published very recently by Penguin. Um, so that's when it really started, two years ago, or just over two years ago, when Alice and I together were fortunate enough to get some funding from the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art to fund the research that led to the exhibition that you can see now. Um, as I said, this is the <coughs> fourth of six talks. The three that have already happened, which were talks by Bev By The Way, no, yeah, Bev By The Way and Brian Biggs, the photographer Pogus Caesar and the photographer Malcolm Glover, who was photographer in residence here in 1981. Um, and Bev By The Way, who was part of, of Jill's team here, there was a team of curators who worked with Jill over the period that she was here from 1980 onwards, that included Bev By The Way and Sarah Edge and Rabana Hamid and Maud Salter. Um, so, yeah, there's a talk by Bev By The Way and Brian Biggs about curating in the north, Brian Biggs of Blue Coat and Liverpool. Um, and the first talk was by Leslie Sanderson and Sarah Ridge. Um, all of those are available online. If you just search Touchstones, Rochdale, YouTube, and the name of whichever speaker you're interested in, you'll find it pretty easily, I think. Um, some of those talks were done online, some were live, like this one. All of them are being recorded, so I should just let you know that. Um, we are recording so that this will add to the, 
the archive of, of, of talks online. Um, nobody will be visible apart from those of us at the front of the room, but when we get to questions at the end, you know, in case it's relevant to anybody, you know, either take note of the fact that you will be being recorded or let us know if you don't want to be. <laughs> so, yeah, so those three are already online. This one will be shortly. There are two more to come on the dates I should know, but I don't. The twin, oh, if anybody wants to know, they're on the Touchstones website. But the two remaining talks are in two weeks' time on a Wednesday, which is online, a talk with Harold Affey and Michelle Williams Gamaker, both of whom are contemporary artists who are part of this exhibition, will be talking about portraiture and representation and particularly kind of self-portraiture and the use of the self in, in their work in one way or another. And then the final talk will be live in gallery um, and that's with Veronica Slater who was in an exhibition here in 89 yeah, was, yeah. Um, and, and whose work you'll see upstairs um, and she's going to be in conversation with Sarah Joy Ford who's a young Manchester based textile artist who we commissioned to make work specifically for this show and they'll be talking about kind of queer histories of, of, of art making between the 1980s and now. Um, so I think that's more than enough from me and I'll hand over to Alice who's going to introduce our two esteemed guests. Thanks Derek. Um, just I think on a point of housekeeping if everyone could make sure their mobile phones are on silent and I think Rick this is right that if we hear a fire alarm we need to evacuate because it's not a drill. Um, through the door behind us. Okay, so um, today's uh, conversation, um, I'm delighted to welcome Pete Clark and Keith Piper, both of whom um, uh, exhibited here at Rochdale Art Gallery with solo shows and in group shows and are included um, in the exhibition at all order. Um, Pete Clark is an artist based in Liverpool. He studied at Chelsea School of Art and was until I think fairly recently the MA course leader and principal lecturer at the University of Central Lancashire. Um, he's exhibited widely and his work is in the collection of the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool. Um, Keith Piper um, was a founding member of the Black Art Group and he studied at Trent Polytechnic and the Royal College of Art and you're currently reading no, I'm not quite sure not what I say I'm actually. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I walk in the building, I'm like, what are you again? You <laughs> teach, I, I hope, teach, yes, yes, yeah, just about fine school. art at, at Middlesex. Middlesex University. Yeah. And Keith's solo exhibition, um, Jet Black Futures, was staged at the New Art Gallery Warsaw um, last year. Um, so it brings me great pleasure to welcome you both and thank you both for participating in the show, in this talk today. So, um, as I said, the, the premise of today's conversation is around the exhibition um, depicting history for today, which was staged here at Rochdale, was staged here at Rochdale Art Gallery in 1988. And it was originally um, organised by uh, Mike Tooby at the Mappin Art Gallery in Sheffield and it travelled to Leeds, um, Leeds Art Gallery and then to Rochdale, so um, three <coughs> venues. Each gallery put its own inflection on the show and included um, historic works from the re their respective collections, either sort of at the start or at the end. Um, I'll just pause here because uh, I thought this was a wonderful quote from the Rochdale and Hayward Express. Um, in praise of the exhibition, it is red meat, bluntly political and extremely thought provoking, and all the better for that since one function of art is to challenge established views. So um, bearing in mind that uh, 
that quite often the shows here at Rochdale Art Gallery got uh, criticised in the local press, then that's a pretty astonishing um, uh, review. Um, so the ex I'll just skip back a moment. The exhibition combined um, the work of 13 artists and what was kind of extraordinary perhaps about why the show travelled to Rochdale was that of those 13 artists, Keith Piper and Pete Clark, Sarah Edge, Glennis Johnson, Terry Atkinson, Lebena Himmons, Donald Rodney and David Alker had all already had solo shows here or were in the process of organising a solo show. So there was a great context for bringing these artists together in this space. So Pete's um, exhibition, Constructed Views, um, of this uh, took place in 1984, and Keith's um, uh, solo show, Step Into the Arena, took place in 1991, um, after several years of negotiations and conversations. Um, so I thought we could start um, by perhaps talking about some of the works, your contributions to uh, depicting history for today and getting a little bit of context about um, the work that you showed, what you were making at the time, um, and, uh, and why you think perhaps um, the theme of history was so prevalent in art practice at the time in the 1980s. So um, Pete, you showed um, these works, Burning of the Town Halls of 1986. So would you like to say something? Okay, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, I had a show uh, initially, well, in, in, in Liverpool, which then became Rochdale, uh, called Constructed View. So I was very interested in the notion of construction as a, as a metaphor, as an idea, and as a process. And in 1985, uh, courtesy of the Conservative government, they decided to abolish the county councils of Merseyside and Greater Manchester, and obviously the GLC. And uh, whatever people think about uh, the GLC or whatever, some of the debates and issues of, that Ken Livingston, etc., were promoting uh, were very much part of the debate, certainly on, on Merseyside. And the county council was being abolished, uh, as I say, Merseyside and Greater Manchester. So the, ca the two county councils decided as a sort of swan song, I guess, to commission various artists. And they commissioned six artists to look at the relationship or the links between Liverpool and Manchester. And somebody who's lived in Liverpool for a long time realised there's... Uh, more antagonism between Liverpool and Manchester than there ever is between links. And so I was researching, trying to come up with some idea about questions around representation, particularly because we were being funded incredibly well in retrospect by the county councils. And I came across a watercolour in the museum in Liverpool that was a copy of a painting by Wright of Derby called The Burning of Liverpool Town Hall. And I, that struck me as a very interesting metaphor for what was happening about local democracy, um, the sort of centralisation of power in London and the fact that Thatcher hated uh, the Labour-run county councils. And so I used that as a beginning to do this series. Um, the other thing I was quite reading around at the time is the exhibition at Rochdale, The Constructed Views, I, I was very interested in some of these uh, glib statements that politicians come out with, like levelling up and uh, bring back better or whatever, or family values or Victorian values. And obviously living in a city like Liverpool, there's a profound contradiction between the very glamorous, opulent city centre, the sort of Georgian, uh, Victorian sort of museums, galleries, town hall, low courts, obviously funded from various colonial exploitation and the state of the living conditions of a lot of people in Liverpool. And I, I was reading around the notion of Victorianism and of course I came up with that classic um, book written by Benjamin Disraeli, uh, Sybil, I think it was 1845, um, where he talks about two nations. I won't repeat the quote, but basically uh, one of the characters uh, in, in the novel um, says something like uh, 
this marvellous Queen's country is the best in the world, but in, in actual fact there are two nations, the rich and the poor, that have no correspondence, no communication, eat the different sorts of food. And I thought that was quite an interesting beginning uh, for the, the painting. So one of the paintings in depicting history was called The Red Town Halls, Two Nations, Two Cities. Um, and they're all a bit... I don't know, apocalyptic now. Maybe I've calmed down a bit since then. Um, but, uh, but that, in a sense, was... And to cut it a long story short, after I left... Um, the, well, after the exhibition in Rochdale finished, I applied and I, be, I was artist re in residence in the Kelvin Flats in Sheffield, um, which was a smaller version of the Hyde Park Flats, the sort of Cabousier walkways in the sky. And again... Uh, as, I, as it replicates my own history, having come from a sort of council house background, I was very interested in social housing from Liverpool and or in Sheffield, and that's how I got to know Mike Tooby, and then from that he commissioned or selected me for the Depicting History show. Fantastic. That's great. That's brilliant. And um, Keith, um, you, in the Depicting History show, you exhibited the Seven Rages of Man, which yes 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 and I wondered if you could say yeah. something about that that piece. Which is really interesting, actually, because it is in a sense um, um, one of the most um, uh, 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 um, one of the you know, works which are most is concerned with the articulation of history, the most exploring historical narrative. But in fact, this work was never supposed to have been in the show. <laughs> And I remember I got into some trouble with either Mike because I was supposed to have made an, uh, 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 a new work. And for some reason, usual you know, disorganisation and chaos, I didn't make the new work. So I gave him this work, which had been made for um, a show in 1984, which was a show at, at the Black Art Gallery in Finsbury Park. Um, and it was very much a piece about how we articulate historical narratives. And so it was an attempt to kind of speak about this long historical arc of, of African people from originally in West Africa through the slave trade, through to, uh, all those experiences to, through my immigration here and then projecting this future state. And it was very much in line with the kind of work that I was making in 1984. And it was featured in this in the first in the first solo show that I had, which was in that year. Um, and so, it, it it was a highly historical piece. Um, ha it was um, it it and came um, first to kind of Sheffield, I think it was the mapping. Um, it then toured here. It then went to another. Went, went to Leeds. And oh, then, and yeah, then to yeah, Russia. went to Leeds went to Russell, and to cut a long story short, it never came back. Um, I think something happened where um, apparently um, we made some agreement where the galleries would hold on to the work to store them, but nobody told me. They apparently, they told Donald Rodney, and he said, yeah, yeah, that's fine, but he, he then didn't tell me. And I forgot that the work was here. <laughs> long story short, 20 years later, Somebody from, from Sheffield contacted me and said that they found these boxes with my name on it. And so opening the boxes, we find this work, or a part of this work, you know, from 1984. And then it went on and we remade it. And then it became um, um, the kind of centre of a display which was on in Sheffield up until just a few months ago, I think. Um, which was an, an attempt to kind of um, use this, this work as a way of discussing a range of historical artefacts from their collection. Because I'm, I'm kind of really interested in the way that kind of various histories can be articulated um, and the various versions of history that Atom, we can come up with and how we compare those. So that's pretty much my answer. Brilliant. Well, when I was sort of looking at... Um the exhibition catalogue and reading Pete's catalogue and, and, and thinking about your work, Keith, what really struck me was the ways in which you were both engaging with um, the histories of imperialism 
um, perhaps coming at them from mm. different starting points, but actually engaging with um, the legacies of imperialism and the built environment, in your case, um, Pete, through the, the opulent buildings of Liverpool and, and the spaces that, that, um, that we move through. And then with your work, Keith, um, the, the legacies of the slave, um, the, the trade in enslaved people, and, um, and your engagement with symbols, and particularly um, for both of you, actually, um, your engagement with, with capitalism as a structuring feature of contemporary society, society in the 1980s. So um, I wondered if you could both perhaps reflect a bit on, on that theme of capitalism and history um, in your work and how you were trying to engage with, with those, those issues, those questions. Um, <laughs> gosh. I suppose I was quite interested in, you know, going back to the quote I was talking about, the notion of two nations, I was very interested in the sort of contradictions. Uh, I mean, originally I'm from East Lancashire, so <clears throat> all my um, historical family had all worked in the textiles in industry, had all worked in the, the local mills, in the cotton mills. Um, so moving eventually to Liverpool in the late 70s, and again, uh, just the experience of of living in, in Liverpool. Um, again, the, the sort of contradiction between the sort of monumental, almost symbols of power and authority that you get in all the statues. Um, I mean, there's the amazing statue um, in uh, Exchange Flags behind the town hall. It's, it's attributed, it's supposed to be about Nelson's victories, but there's these amazing classical slaves that are holding up this, uh, this figure so I was very interested in, in how we represent notions of history, notions of power, and then con contrasting that with what I thought was the sort of deindustrialised de city of Liverpool. Um, and then contrasting that with no sh the quote that was very common, the notion of Victorian values. I mean, the Albert Dock, you know, Queen Victoria's uh, husband, was derelict then, now it's, it's, uh, it's the Tate and the tourist attraction, etc. But at the time, I mean, we, I used to take students, we used to break in there and do sort of Andy Goldsworthy type things in all the derelict docks. Um, so there was a massive contradiction between uh, the warehouses that originally would have stored the, um, the, the goods, you know, cotton, sugar, etc., and you know, my own personal history of the, the textiles Industries. I mean, in the, night of the early 80s, my father had been made redundant. So I was very, I was very angry in a sense about the relationship of, um, you know, the politics. I mean, Liverpool in the 1980s, if you remember, um, attempted this uh, struggle against the government. I mean, Liverpool's always had a very peculiar political history. It was only, I think, in 1983 when actually the council was run by the Labour Party. I mean, historically, the Labour Party in Liverpool was the Catholic Party, and the working, the, the Protestant working class would either vote Tory, or if they hated the Tories, would vote Liberal, and so the, the Liberal Party ran the city. And there was um, a constant debate about, uh, you know, cuts to the local authority and how they would save money. And the argument always from the Liberal Party was to put up council rents at the expense of the rates. So in a sense, social housing at the time was incredibly, was awful, to be honest. The tenement flats had a very poor um, repair system. The direct labour from the council had virtually no money. I remember, I, come, I was born in Burnley, so I'm not, it's not something that I'm particularly privileged that, that I found a, a problem. Uh, but contrasting the sort of almost like the municipal civic pride you get in northern towns with what I saw in Liverpool. Uh, and then I tried to think about how I would make work trying to reconcile these notions of different sorts of representation, the sort of different sort of subject of representation uh, and comparing that with uh, various objects that I was trying to represent. Um, so in a sense it was, 
it was that way of trying to come to terms. You know, from my own point, we're trying to make sense of what was happening. You know, mm. that's fascinating. And the thing it actually struck after me is that we are kind of the same age, presumably. <laughs> I think. And looking at the audience, I mean, there are some young faces here. However, um, I'm thinking that a lot of people here were at school in the 1970s, where people kind of came through. I was at secondary school in the 1970s. And so in terms of the kind of version of history that we were taught, you know, we were taught a very specific kind of structure of history. And I think all of us, in terms of kind of young, young and black kids, young, young and white working class kids, if everyone felt that, in a sense, that version of history didn't quite explain the sort of shifting context which we were growing up into. And so I think that, that in that period in the early 80s, there was a, a lot of this kind of um, act of excavating. I was trying to think through, to kind of find um, different sources of information. And of course, in the early 80s, those sources were actually quite difficult to find. I remember that, you know, because, you know, I mean, obviously this is the pre-internet age. Um, and so you could only find, you know, alternative histories through going through particular bookshops, going through whatever. But I think there was that, that beginning of um, an attempt to excavate things. And I remember, and you speaking about, about um, how we would, would respond to public monuments. Hmm. I remember that, um, when the Black Audio Film Collective did their... Um, their signs of empire mm. and trophy. Yeah. Um, I found that incredibly powerful because for the first time, you know, well, not for the first time, but um, this was a thing which was um, artists looking at, you know, the um, physical landscape, the urban landscape and the monuments that had been left and beginning to try <laughs> and, and think through a new, a new history. Oh, yes. Empire. So this was um, the, the um, trophies <laughs> of empire was made after just after um, seeing um, the um, signs of empire. And I'm going to say that I was not in any way influenced by, <laughs> because they will charge me, they will send me the invoice if I, <laughs> if I say hey, that. However, I was really intrigued. This was produced just after I first moved down to London. I um, was reading um, Capitalism and Slavery, I remember. Um, um, Capitalism and Slavery, the Eric Williams book where he was um, um, really exploring the ways in which very particular legacies of, of, of um, colonialism were built into you know, landscape systems, buildings, etc. So I was very interested in something which would attempt to, to explore that. Um, it's a lot less poetic than the Black Audio stuff was, much more prosaic. Um, so I really want to just make a point. Um, yeah, and so from that point, I've always been interested in, in kind of um, what could be broadly termed history painting. But in terms of, you know, the work of artists and, and other artists who are actually looking through archives and looking at history and looking at the way that history, history is a told. And I think, and I think um, it's very encouraging that a lot of it seems to be happening now. And so our kind of collective understanding of multiple histories is becoming more and more complex because more and more pe people are excavating the stuff mm -hmm. and coming up with their, their own takes on it. But I think it's really well, it's interesting. Quite, it's quite interesting in Liverpool because where, wherever you walk, there are monuments to the great and good of Victorian society, various philanthropists. And there's only one uh, monument and that's to the heroes of the engine room and that's mm. to the engineers that went down in the Titanic which is hidden away um, near the Isle of Man ferry terminal. Oh, and it's a very bizarre monument. In fact, that sort of painting that I did that's on the front cover with that rather scruffy-looking object in the middle, that was an attempt to represent that, um, the heroes of mm. the engine room, right. to try and contrast that with the sort of Victorian uh, and or the, the 19th century politicians that were celebrated mm. for very dubious reasons. Mm. Well, it's really interesting. It perhaps leads quite nicely onto um, uh, my next question, was was about um, medium specificity, and obviously, Keith, um, Keith, you've worked in painting, digital media, film, or 
sculptural installation as well. Um, and Pete, you've worked principally in, well, you started as a printmaker um, at Liverpool Polytechnic teaching printmaking mm. um, and moved into painting, but you've also been thinking about um, the rhetoric of the photographic image and how the black and white documentary photograph conveys um, information and, and how you might translate or work with some of those um, <coughs> ideas. And when Keith, you were talking about sort of excavating history and uh, looking in archives, that made me think about um, collage and this finding of different pieces of information and drawing them together in your work. And, and both of you have used collage in different ways um, in your work, but I think it's quite interesting. So I was interested into why both of you were drawn to using collage in your work, um, bearing in mind that the art historian Benjamin Booklow has described collage and montage as, quote, a powerful propaganda tool for mass agitation. <laughs> mm. um. <laughs> Where do you go from there? Um, I mean, I suppose, I mean, I've always sort of wandered between printmaking and painting in, in lots of ways. I mean, I come from that classic um, Euston Road British art school tradition, uh, the foundation course in Burnley. Um, I think we were allowed to do something about this big, but it was all... Um, and then I, I, when I was at Bristol uh, uh, doing the degree, I got very interested in, in, in sort of Rauschenberg. So I, I was very interested in the process of, in a sense, storytelling, for want of a better. Um, and then particularly in the, the, those paintings that were in Rochdale in the 1980s, um, that I was, I was sort of started making prints and the prints got larger and they eventually they became collages and then eventually they became paintings. But I was quite interested in the sort of um, the sort of debates between uh, what I would define as realism and naturalism. Um, I mean, excuse me if I, if for photographers in the audience, but I had this notion that a lot of photography was a sort of naturalistic process that represented the surface appearances of things. I think Brecht meant, talks about photographs of the engineering cook factory, that um, a photograph doesn't tell you about industrial production. And so I was quite interested, particularly in the early 80s, um, one of my few claims to fame was that uh, we slept through the riots in 1981. We lived next door to a pub. And so there was absolute mayhem going on outside. And I thought, oh, bloody hell, the pub's kicking off again. <laughs> and when I woke up, and I suddenly realised there was police and smoke air everywhere. But because of that, I mean, Liverpool became a metaphor for every sort of documentary journalist and taking very partial photographs of the city to reinforce whatever views the particular newspaper they were coming from. So I'd started to do these paintings about social housing, um, incorporating photography, and particularly that debate you got in photography at the time between black and white, truth-telling and colour photography. So I purposely made the paintings black and white to a certain extent, or warm, cool. And I was very interested in, in a sense, a more realist debate where there, there was, you were I was trying to interrogate the image, for want of a better phrase, by using uh, various collages to try and create a context from what, where the image uh, was situated. So that was the logic um, behind the collage. And also incorporating text. I guess like um, most people, who moved to Liverpool, they see themselves as failed poets. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so I, I've always incorporated words or texts or the titles. I've always been very interested in whether we read paintings or whether we look at paintings, that's, that sort of thing. So, so collage at the time be, became a sort of way of talking about how we construct appearances. That's why the show Rochdale was called Constructed Views. Mm. It's fascinating that we are both um, interested or were influenced by the work of Rauschenberg. Yeah. Just in terms of that use of kind of found imagery and the sure. kind of, you know, um, the mixing in of, of, 
of, of materials, paints, the photographic image, etc., etc. So I think that's that's actually fascinating. Um, in terms of collage, always an interest coming from from um, school. But I think um, it was that moment in the, and I'm trying to think when there was really a surge in kind of sampled music, in in kind of popular culture in. In kind of dance music, etc. Yes, and that was in the mid eighties, nineties, mid. Yeah, early mid eighties. Yeah, yeah, but because that was hugely influential, and also because um, I had a lot of peers who were who were sonic artists and musicians. They were working a lot with samples, etc., etc. Et but the um, thing about a sample. That, um, in relationship to um, collage, that if, if, every song has the imprint of the original music that it came down from. So if you took a sample from James Brown or whatever, it then conjured that particular history and carried that that at a moment into your work. And I, I, and I always found that a really fascinating way of beginning to revisit the kind of the kind of ghosts or echoes of earlier practices within your practice or earlier archival objects within your practice. So I think that was one of the kind of things that's really interested me about collage. When you bring these things together and overlay them, etc., to one of those, one of the inherited meanings which come with those things, and then what is the new meaning or range of meanings which can happen, you know, as they come together. And that co coincided with my growing interest in in the use of particular technologies. You know, it was first it was first photocopy machines, and then you know sampling and and the use of, of kind of cheap computers to kind of bring stuff together. So is that kind of interesting? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I wonder if because um, we you probably don't know, but we share a sort of tutor in common. Uh, Who's that? Um, when you were copying to you were taught by John Yeadon. Oh, everyone's taught by John Yeadon. Uh, and exactly he didn't actually yeah. teach me, but when I was on foundation, mm. he appeared in a pink suit. And I think he was the first political <coughs> artist I'd ever met. I mm. think I was 16 at the time. Ah, amazing. Yes. Um, and then I got involved in a lot of the, the, the associated mm. stuff that John was involved in, the magazine Artery and things like oh, that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, it was quite strange at the time because... <coughs> I remember going for an interview for a job. Well, in fact, I remember when I was at Chelsea, one of the tutors say, we take one of you every year. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and as I say, I remember going for an interview for a job when I was asked to define the colour red in, in, in a university that should remain nameless. Um, so I suppose trying to make work like that, um, it, it was... And also, I think there was a, one of the things I, I, I keep thinking about the 90s, and maybe I, I'm right or maybe I'm wrong, but I think there was a massive difference in the art world between the private galleries, which were London based, and the sort of municipal galleries that were sort of funded by the local authorities. Or even in London, again, one of the things that was interesting about depicting history, a lot of people in the show actually showed at the Pentonville Gallery oh, yes, that was funded right. by the yeah. GLC. I, I was in three or four shows at the Pentonville Gallery. So, again, it, there was a, a, a noticeable difference in the art world between the public and the private. Maybe not so much these days. I mean, the, the, the notion of public and private have got sadly... Well, I think the public is slowly moving and getting taken over by the private. So I think that was an important thing. So I think there was an autonomy about galleries. So places like Rochdale that was funded, however they got on with the local authority, were well supported and I think a lot of the galleries, the Blue Coat in Liverpool was quite well supported by the council um, and all the, you know, the Harris in Preston, yeah. Oldham, etc. And I think that was quite an important, they were, they were creating the possibilities for artists to show that I'm not so sure would happen now. I know when I moved to Liverpool in 1978 um, to work at the art school, you got a feeling that if anybody was doing anything remotely interesting, you would show at the blue coat eventually. Mm -hmm. That Brian would see your work, mm -hmm. and that was an important, you know, um, step, you know, for mm -hmm. artists. I mean, it's not easy to sustain a practice as an artist, and having some sort of support from galleries is quite important. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree, and, and and it's amazing. I mean, I've only seen this show for the first time. 
um, this after uh, noon. But it's kind of this um, um, this real sense that in terms of the way that um, publicly funded spaces in the 1980s were really beginning to kind of ask questions around how do we how do we reposition the things that we do in order to begin to, to represent and give visibility to these groups that you know were formally locked out of these of these systems and the fact that the way that Rochdale here um, places like the Blue Coats and other you know similar spaces were really attempting to, to, to kind of strategically open themselves up to other kinds of practices um, in a way which yes was kind of was kind of rare and surprising them. and the Pentaville also I didn't realise that that was um, um, a GLC funded space well it closed down when the yeah. GLC closed down yes 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 because we just had um, the, um, Donald myself both had a show um, there just before it closed down um, and the kinds of arguments which are being used within this show it's interesting to, to uh, see how they've evolved you know now and so in a sense um, the kind of language about representation and, and kind of visibility you know I mean spaces like the Tates are now just me are now you know <laughs> attempting to embrace those kinds of arguments but it very much started with these spaces in the 1980s yeah I think it's important. We had a conversation with Bev, by the way, and um, and Brian Biggs uh, a few weeks ago, and we were talking about these networks of northern curators and how they were supporting each other, learning from each other. And it's interesting looking at both of your CVs, actually thinking about that you both exhibited with Brian at the Blue Coat, you both exhibited with Mike Tooby in Sheffield. You were both here in Rochdale. You both at different times worked with Beth, by the way. After she left Rochdale, she went to Corner House in Manchester. So um, so there's these interconnections and overlappings, which I think um, uh, are, are very significant and haven't really been discussed um, sort of in a broader art history. Um, and but going back to what you're thinking about in terms of representation, in um, the catalogue for Pete's Constructive Views um, catalogue, the, uh, the uh, sorry, essay, um, David Campbell, who writes the essay, uh, asks the question or poses the question, what does it mean to take up representations of Queen Victoria in 1984? And, and that just made me think about even the title of this conversation and the exhibition depicting history for today. What did it mean to depict history in 1984, in 1988, as opposed to depicting what we have essentially upstairs as a historical show, um, depicting a, a history? Um, but I wondered if you could sort of reflect on the nature of depicting history and, and differences between what you were doing in the 80s and maybe how, you're, okay. how you were thinking about history now. Well, when I um, when I was in the the depicting history show, um, you know, you have to do the classic little CV statement, and I quote, I, I use the quote from Marx about men make their own history, but not under conditions of their own choosing. That in a sense we act in history and, and on history, that we try to make sense of um, of history, and of course we're surrounded by history, aren't we? Um, it, it, to make sense of, of anything, you've only got to turn on Question Time and sort of look, you know, look at the debates going around. What happens you know, the, in the Brexit debates or whatever? So history is 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 an important metaphor that needs to be challenged and constantly fought for. In a sense, you know, whose history are we fighting for? In that sense, you know, whose history is being erased? I mean, not all those questions. I mean, obviously, Keith. I mean, the first show I saw of yours was the Black Skin Blue Coat oh, show yes. Uh, yes. when I was living in, well, in yeah. Liverpool, which is a very powerful show about uh, how, we, how history is represented and who's not in history. Um, so I guess that was always the question around individually how we position ourselves 
in debates around history, I guess. Of course. Well, it's impossible to kind of look at any history painting and not have to reflect on the moment in history in which it was made. Because obviously the moment in history in which it was made then, then you know, it encapsulates how it is, mm. it's framing history. So yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah, and the, the press release, the, the Rochdale press release for the depicting history um, for today exhibition, um, it states that the exhibition was uh, concerned with the depiction of history, specifically questioning its status as truth and presenting alternatives. So um, we've got a bit of time left. I was just wondering if we could, maybe in our post-truth um, moment, um, <laughs> reflect on truth as well. <laughs> well, we live in a peculiar world. I mean, driving over today, I was listening to the radio, and there's some poor woman in America who's been sacked because uh, she was doing a, a project with the school kids on the Renaissance and showed Michelangelo's David, and mm. she was regarded as obscene and pornographic, so she's got sacked. I mean, we're living in a rather curious world now. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I'm very interested in, uh, sadly, in politics. I shout at the television most evenings. Um, but it is, it is bizarre. I mean, I can't think. There's a there's a journalist. I can't think what he, he, he's on Radio Four a lot, and he he, he does a program about politicians on the radio, and he was talking about Ted Heath, and to a certain extent, Ted Heath, he was arguing, was to the left of Tony Blair, and. Uh, and you start to think, gosh, you know, the, the way things have shifted in, in lots of ways is quite terrifying. I mean, obviously, um, one of the things I've been involved in for many t years with Brian Briggs at the Blue Coat is an exchange with Cologne. I, I do a collaborative project with a, with a Cologne artist. And uh, the whole Brexit debate has put a, a real dampener on all the initiatives and the projects we were doing because of the nature of just literally... I mean, in the past, going taking work to Cologne was just like taking it to Manchester, to, except it took a bit longer and you went on the ferry. I mean, now this sort of bureaucracy, the potential import charges you have to pay and all the stuff for that is... So in a sense, um, the whole... The consequences of politics is quite profound at the moment. I mean, sadly, um, I mean, the elections are coming up in May, aren't they? And... Um, this notion of proving your identity to vote. Mm. I mean, these are all strategies, I would argue, to try and uh, delegitimize elections in a sense. I mean, in local authority elections, I think in Liverpool it's got the, the, uh, the great record of the lowest turnout. I think, in one of the, I think it was 20 odd percent in one of the local uh, authority mm. elections. So, you know, people being disenfranchised is, is, is quite an important issue of our time. Absolutely. I've been struggling to remember the... Um, and what's that quote about he who controls the past, controls the future, present, or... or what is that quote? <laughs> he who controls the past, controls the present, controls the future, controls the present, controls the future. Is that the one? This idea it's that... Something like that. <laughs> yeah, something like that. This whole idea that... The, those who can who can declare historical narrative mm. can then shape our perceptions of the present and therefore shape mm. how we move into the future. Mm. And so that has always been like highly contested and becoming even more so. Mm. And also in terms of the debate around around post truth, a lot of that is bound up with. Um, the sorts of information, information or misinformation systems coming through from online source sources, because in a sense anybody can then place their truth into the public domain, mm -hmm. and people will then pick up on that and say. And so, yes, we are in a moment when the idea of how we look at history and the various ways of look, looking at his history are highly contested, and um, we're in a moment when the way in which we frame history is in itself highly politicised. Um, so in a sense, yes. So, um, one of the things which I'm most intrigued by now is, um, is how much more complex a lot of 
historical moments are than even you know those of us who looked at history a lot um, realize. So I'm learning used new, new stuff at the age of 60, art, art, which I didn't know. And I'm like amazed that these were things which I was look, looking at and reading for a long time and there's like information there, really important in information which I was not aware of. So my whole sense of history is shifting quite radically. But it's shifting because of the complexity of, of information, speculation, evidence, sometimes mis-evidence <clears throat> that we can now access. So yeah, I don't know if that helps. So, yeah, no, but it also makes me go back to this notion of collage as mm. um, a, a system of interrogation, of cutting, breaking, layering, rearticulating, and and building together, or constructing different views of things through mm. through um, through mm. juxtaposition. Yeah, yeah, which is why I think your both of your use of collage is so interesting. Well, I was a, I mean, again, God, it sounds like a, a, a boring academic here, but one of the things I was very interested in was sort of Brecht theatre at one time. I know the Boehner that I work with at Preston is a big Brecht theatre. But that notion that Brecht talks about an alienation effect. You know, when you get, you watch a Brecht play and, I don't know, it's Mother Courage or whatever, and there's a war going on, and suddenly somebody comes on the stage with a funny hat and sings a song. And that sort of fragments the narrative. Yeah. And it, it creates that notion that the audience, rather than being passive consumers, have to reconstruct what's going on. And it, to a certain extent, I would see collage in a similar way, mm -hmm. that it fragments the sort of appearances of an image, going back to that realism, naturalism thing I'm trying to say. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, in a sense, people have to reassemble uh, the fragmentation to make sense of what the images are doing. I mean, in a funny sort of way, the, uh, in the sort of post-impressionist world of ours, there's almost like an imaginary line on the floor that you stand at to look at a Monet and to realise that those blobs and bush strokes are actually a haystack. And I suppose one of the things about collage, it forces you to, to rupture that line, mm -hmm. that you have to go and engage with the work by reading or seeing what's on the surface and standing by it. So it's the, the detail and trying to see the whole picture at the same time. So I suppose those were the sort of, I suppose the thoughts I was, um, that's probably why I was sat there miserable. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great video at the Blue Coat where I have a studio where they've interviewed various artists and I, I end up saying something like, yes, having a studio, I, li I like to be engaged in things, otherwise it's like being in a mon mon monastic cell where I sit there drinking tea and feeling mm. miserable. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you're not miserable today. <laughs> no. um, but you touched on something just there, and I think it's been sort of touched on earlier as well, and I wanted to pick it up um, now, is, is also your both of your use of text and image and um, and how and why you were utilising text and image in your work and what did you think you were um, gaining or adding by that, that combination? Um, well, I suppose I'm quite an interesting gallery watcher and it's very interesting when you watch people go through... Um, I mean, I was in an exhibition recently at the Walker Art Gallery about painting in Liverpool. And, of course, there's all sorts of educational stuff that goes with it. And uh, I was watching some of the students, and they were just going around with their phones, and they were photographing the text panels. And they, and they went around. And it's actually very interesting, because, in a sense, that's the first thing a lot of people do when they see your work, is they, re they go to the text panel. So I was always trying to find some mechanism of incorporating that desire to read into the painting and that notion about whether we look at paintings or whether we read paintings. Um, so, you know, even when I think back on my foundation course, or certainly when I was a, a student at Bristol, I, I did a whole series of paintings based on a Brian Patton po poem called Through All Your Abstract Reasoning. And again, trying to, uh, I suppose it's like contextualise or shift the narrative with text. Um, I mean, when I left Bristol, 
not that I want to bore you with any autobiography, <laughs> but uh, I decided to give up art and I went to live on the Isle of Wight um, because I, I thought I was going to be a writer. So I sat writing t awful poems for a few <laughs> years before I went back to Chelsea. And I think I've always liked that notion, that uh, relationship between painting and poetry, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I think we, we probably share that in terms of, um, of kind of, of, I've always been interested in the idea of storytelling mm -hmm. and um, the attempt to make these objects which sit on, on walls, these little objects, into things which could, through which you could articulate a narrative. So therefore, something like um, the Seven Rages work um, had lots of la la lots of writing on it in this yeah. attempt to, to kind of take the viewer through um, a particular sense of uh, of history. And I remember that um, that you know, coming through the art and art schools system, which would which would be quite hostile to that you know use of text or that much text um, on an art object on art. On a visual art object, I remember um, that initially I only found that that it could work when I saw um, the work of a, of a Rastafarian artist called Ras Lucas. Um, this was really in the early eighties. Um, went to he had a show on somewhere in Birkbeck, and it was image with a lot of text. And and from this, just getting the sense that um, if the text was engaging, you would actually read it. You would actually then engage with this. Um, but obviously there's a whole range of things around um, the relationship between um, a visual image and a text and how they affect each other, etc. Um, I think my, um, the fact that, that, that I've moved on to, to, to attempt to articulate stories through a time base, you know, and so text can either be read or, or is expressed through time. In video or whatever, I think that's that's kind of an attempt to to engage with with more complex bits of writing within an art object by using by using time. I suppose. I mean, when I think back to when I was at Chelsea, I mean, I, I thought initially I was going to be painting at Chelsea on the MA, but I ended up in printmaking. I suppose it was the sort of post-punk late seventies when I was there. But of course, it's not surprising. I mean, we're saturated with mm. image and text. I mean, if you forget fine art, just walk down the average street, see billboards, posters everywhere. Mm. So, yeah, we are quite accustomed to reading that relationship yes, between yes. word and image, looking at different sort of languages. Um, so I, I, I've, I've always found it rather curious that why people have had any issues with that within painting, because mm. that's, that's the, the culture we live in, you know, whether you like it or Mm. Sure. Mm. Because it makes it difficult for it to be international. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have an English text on the thing. That's, that's it. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> um, open it. Yes, I was about Question to say. So. Um, thank you so much for that. We've covered a lot of ground, um, and I would like to invite the audience, if they have any questions. Um, to either put your hand up, shout them out. Yeah, um, do. Derek, do you have anything? Um, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't anticipating that first. But, um, I mean, in a way, I'd, I'd like to just briefly come back to what you were saying, both of you, but particularly you, Pete, about, about municipal galleries mm -hmm. and the importance of the support of, of local councils and in the case of London, the GLC. Um, and when you were talking about that, I was looking something up um, in relation specifically to Rochdale, which had a Labour Council throughout, more or less throughout the 80s. There was a very brief period where it was not overall control. And I mean, it, it's been very clear to us researching this show that, that a lot of what happened here couldn't have happened initially without the support of the local authority and, you know, at least tacitly the support of, of the local authority. And I think as the 80s went on, there were ways in which the local authority here was influenced by 
things that happened here and, and, and it was kind of recognised that, that visual arts might be important. Um, things changed mm. in the later 80s and into the 90s, um, which is a different part of this story. But in 1987, the Labour Party in Rochdale published a manifesto for its community and leisure services department, which is what the art gallery was part of. And it was called Building from Strength. So I'm just going to read one paragraph from it, if you'll indulge me. We see the role of socialist arts as being to raise awareness in people in Rochdale of the limitations inherent in, inherent in capitalist-centred attitudes through creativity in a communal context, to enhance the environment and people's lives through the promotion of values of work and self-confidence, dissociated from pecuniary and occupational considerations, to demystify art and the creative process, and encourage people to realise and operate their ability to change their circumstances through cooperative and collective strength, to educate and democratise all in the process of cultural creation and definition as a bastion against both elitist art and state-created mass consumption. Our policy will be to prioritise support for artists who work collectively, whose art is committed to the above principles, and who are willing to work as part of the movement towards cultural democracy. It's very hard to imagine. You get expelled from the Labour Party. Especially if possibly a Labour one now, mm. writing any such manifesto. And it's mm. just mm. an illustration, mm. in a way, of, of how much there was a support structure that enabled yes. the kind of work that was shown in a gallery like this mm. and the kind of exhibition programming that happened here was. was Kind of reinforced by that, and, and I guess we're talking about depicting history today without the capital letters of the exhibition title. It's kind of harder to do that in the art world that we find ourselves in now. And when was that historically? Um, 87. 87, oh, 87. Okay. 87, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's when this show was being thought yes. about, yeah. wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting also because. Um, in his review of Depicting History for Today, um, that was published in Art Monthly, Guy Brett identifies the fact that at that moment in 1987-88, there were lots of exhibitions of contemporary art that were engaging with art and history and arts history. Mm. Um, and, and one of which was this show, um, Art History, Contemporary Artists of Britain, which was at the Hayward yeah, Gallery, right. um, which Keith was in. Um, so were you aware of this sort of moment of thinking about history in a, um, amongst your peers and amongst curators? Well, aware of it amongst our peers, and obviously, you know, within what was broadly then called the Black Art Movement, there were a lot of people who were thinking about how to how to speak about history um, within the kind of um, wider art sector. Actually, there are also people, you know, um, uh, and with those particular interests. I suppose um, I would have been less aware of the local government curatorial thing, even though um, 87, the GLC had just gone, hasn't it, 87? So we had been very aware of that whole struggle around the GLC and its closure in London and the implications of that. So th just how that worked in terms of and how that was in impacting a particular type of practice, I think there was an awareness. Um, but I'm not sure. It's I've quite interesting running. to think back without sounding rather nostalgic, but mm. um, I mean, the, the Thatcher government changed the art world overnight because they, they stopped the Arts Council funding purely artists or galleries and they, they brought in the match funding argument mm -hmm. where you had to match fund with enterprise or whoever or, or invent, as we've all struggled with Arts Council forms, invent some sort of um, <laughs> way with them. But I mean that made a massive difference in a sense mm -hmm. that 
galleries, you know, um, you know like the Blue Coat now. Um, I mean, most of the, I mean, I, as I say, I've, it's quite a nice studio there, but the poor old people who work there spend all their lives making grant applications, you know, you see the mm. poor old stressed um, <laughs> yeah. curators or whatever. And I think that's changed. And again, it, it goes back to maybe a rather crude thing I was saying earlier, that division between the public and the private, that in a sense galleries now, the municipal gallery, um, you know, have, have lost a lot of funding over the years and have to make up for that with all sorts of other strategies. I think the other thing about the Arts Council is that it's quite important that, that in the, throughout the 70s and most of the 80s, we were talking about regional arts associations yes. rather mm. than the Arts Council of England. So there was a much greater, yeah. and in relation to the thing about the councils as well, there was a much, lay, there was a much greater mm. connection between the way in which arts were, the arts were funded through the regional arts associations and the local authorities in those areas. Well, that's another thing that was lost. You know, the no, no, you don't. Do you think post yeah. that, 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 you know, that, that regional thing became abandoned? Yes, you're dead right, because in Liverpool there was Merseyside Arts, mm. and before yeah. you applied, you could go and talk to somebody. Yeah. You'd wander into the blue coat and they had an office, and you could talk to uh, Roman Petruchinsky, I think was the mm. director then. Because they funded um, Liverpool Artists Workshop, they gave us mm. money to convert a, a crappy old warehousey place into studios and things like that. They, Merseyside Arts funded an administrator mm. with the studio groups in Liverpool. I mean, all that sort of disappeared when Merseyside Arts went along, I guess, because that was associated with the county councils, I guess. They also had a black and white photocopy with the brilliant point. Yeah, fantastic. I think it's a question at that point. I'm a lot older than you, young men on the front table there. I'm, I'm 79. Um, so, uh, I, I, when I went out to play, I used to shout to my mum, I'm going to play on the bomb site. We didn't think of it as a bomb site, but it was a bomb site. And of course, there was a lot of building houses for heroes mm. and the council houses. Um, I was lucky enough when I was 11 to go to the Manchester High School of Art. And your um, discussion about the things that you were doing at school made me really think about that time um, in history we did the Tudors and the Stuarts. We, we didn't do Victoria or the, the Empire or anything mm. like that. Um, and in English literature it was Shakespeare or anything. Um, but uh, with the First World War and then 20 years and then the Second World War, I can remember when I was at school in the 50s we used to go to Manchester Art Gallery on Portland Street, but I can't remember local art galleries. And of course, I was not at the time aware of public funding. Um, and I wonder whether you ever felt, I felt as though you were really lucky, like you were doing all these really exciting um, society changing ideas that you're having. I wonder whether you ever felt you were building on a bit of a void. And if those years over the world wars, art must have suffered, mustn't it? Local funding must have suffered. I wonder whether you ever, whether you felt that was a void. Mind you, it's still, I mean, I got a taxi recently to go to the Tate and uh, the guy didn't know there was an art gallery in Liverpool at the Tate. So maybe mm. uh, things have not necessarily changed. I, uh, I'm probably a bit older than you think, but I remember, um, sadly, when I was at school, um, a rather curious Church of England uh, school where they cancelled lessons for the whole week because it was Winston Churchill's funeral, mm -hmm. um, which is, I found that difficult to imagine that happening now, especially coming from a, a northern thing, I mean, not that I want to bore you, but I was... I was born in Burnley in the in the sort of miners' home, so he wasn't over popular in, in <laughs> lots of uh, places. I mean, oh. I, I came from a very poor area and just felt extremely lucky that I went to the art school um, over those years where half of every day was doing creative work. You know, mm. the other half of the day was preparing um, to get 
here at Paul Radley the same week in Fort, which suggests I have scrapped and redone <laughs> history and uh, whatever. There's a, there's a great um, project going on. In fact, I think one of the reasons Brian Biggs is not here, because I think he's in Wolverhampton or somewhere, because there's, uh, there's a great project where people have, have uh, researched the art school. And I didn't know that Nelson, where I was brought up, had an art school. I knew Burnley had. And they've documented, it was shown at the Blue Coat. Uh, I forgot the two guys that, uh, who were... Uh, Pardon? It was on here. It was on here. But it's an amazing, um, you know, testament again to that notion of civic pride. That in a sense, um, everywhere um, had, um, you know, a sort of the, the church, the art gallery, the li the public library. And when you see the buildings, they are quite amazing as well. You know, if you see Nelson, the old Nelson Library. It's an incredible sort of neoclassical sort of thing as a tribute to learning. Um, so I think that's, you know. Tony. Yes, thank you, Alison. I'm, I'm a semi-retired art dealer from London. Okay. And I wanted to, but so that's, that's relevant to what I wish to say. So um, I'm picking up on your remarks, which I think are quite correct, about the um, privatisation of the public spaces. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of a year when Paul Hedge, the art dealer in London, was doing annual talks uh, for the end, end of year students in their second year of their MA course at the RCA. And one year he invited me to come and talk about how the practice of an older dealer gets the practice of a younger dealer. And it was a seminar situation. And the, the students at the end questions and the question they put to me by some of them were very anxious because they, they hadn't completed their degree course but they hadn't yet been signed up by an art gallery and they had had all the training in how to, how to devise a, a contract, what to look for, how to negotiate percentages because that's what had happened. It was now all about you're responsible for yourself in your own career. What was more surprising was those small number who had been signed up to art galleries, but they weren't sure, what, what did I think, had they signed up to the right art gallery? <laughs> <laughs> Which I have no answer. Mm -hmm. But can I just add that, Rene, you're quite unusual in your role as an art dealer, in as much as you were supporting artists who, for all intents and purposes, would have been uh, regarded as socialist and exhibited in spaces like Rochdale Art Gallery mm. and you also participated in talks about art and politics and you were engaging with those debates and I, I wonder, so not to put you on the spot, but whether you felt yourself to be sort of out of sync perhaps with the commercial world of, of London in, in that period. Inevitably, to some extent, and for instance, our gallery raised funds. We had a huge fundraiser for Ken Livingston's first run to be mayor. Mm. Were you there? Yes. And uh, it was uh, uh, artists donated, so uh, young, young British artists donated, and older artists donated too. Um, and they were very enthusiastic. Dealers came round, my colleagues. On the other galleries, I overheard one of them saying, I really don't support Ken Livingston's politics, but I could get something cheap here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, there's this tension going on all the time. It isn't the best of practices to pursue, but one pursues it and survives mm. in one's niche. Mm. And it's so encouraging to see your exhibition here. It's such an inspiration to come back to this. And to know that it's still going on, this is still this strong political element. But before coming up here, I reread John A. Walker's mm -hmm. wonderful chronology of the 1970s, where he goes into a year by year uh, about the artists and the critics and the writers, and was it Paul Overy and uh, Richard Cork, uh, and the disputes between them. But you get the sense as you go through the 70s that the, the sort was already beginning uh, on them getting harder and harder. So they were doing exhibitions like Art for Whom and other titles. So 
Whitechapel and the Serpentine and outside of London. Um, but as soon as Thatcher came in, as soon as this notion of the liberalization of the individual to decide for themselves, it fragmented the solidarity to a great extent. And seeing the exhibition here is a reminder there still is solidarity. It's wonderful. Yes, I wonder if uh, that the sort of 80s decade. Uh, Again, going back to what I was saying about the Arts Council, but the notion in the 90s, the freeze gen, the artist as entrepreneur that seemed to be uh, a popular line, which is a rather curious notion. We've got a question here and then one at the back, and then I think we might have to round up, but please. It's possibly quite a personal observation, really, but with the exhibition upstairs, we've got a, a, a very, very important <coughs> memory for me, um, partly because of this conversation you're having today, partly because when the art gallery got taken over by Jill and Sarah and Lena and Marge, it became a space where a different audience was invited in. And the types of work that you've shown here, that other people upstairs have shown here, they gave permission to people locally. Not to necessarily change history, but to think about themselves in a different light, to think that maybe, Keith mentioned before about being part of a peer group that had a peer group that were artists, a peer group that were the cultural producers, that was new, that was different, that was, yes, there was a peer group of artists who were making really important contemporary work in the country, and it was being exposed here, where, as was pointed out before, before that, I didn't know there was an art gallery. Yeah. Now, on the, on the personal journey there, it relates very closely to what Derek then shared about the manifesto, because it's not just about running a gallery here and then being supported by the artists who come and show in that gallery, because that's the relationship. <coughs> You can make a space, but no point in making a space unless artists are prepared to put themselves on the line and occupy that space. And then the manifesto, of course, Jill and, and others were involved in doing that. That, for the next generation of artists, did made a, a very significant shift because you no longer expect yourself to go make art because you wanted to be in a gallery. You expect yourself to go make art because you want to be part of a political movement where, the, where you had a role in a collective voice. Mm -hmm. And I think that's now, in this art part of the country and other urban centres where there has been a tradition of art schools forming part of the local economy. That really has become part of the richness of that local economy again because you, it's an alternative economy. It's about creating collectives, it's about creating positive moments of cultural building and it's about opening up spaces for new voices and stuff like that. So your legacy, the legacy of this exhibition upstairs, is still really resonant and still gives me a lot of positivity for the future no matter what the colour of the moment. Mm. Yes, it's one of the things, we, we set up a thing called Liverpool Artists Workshop and we got money from Merseyside Arts to do our Desert Island Discs. We invited all our favourite artists and curators to come to Liverpool to do a talk in the workshop on the proviso that we couldn't afford to pay them anything, but we could pay, we could take them out for a meal and or pay the train ticket. So we had Griselda Pollock came, um, she came to, so we could take her to the Everyman for, for, for a sandwich. Terry Atkinson came and donated the money to the miners. And uh, we had a whole litany of, uh, of uh, the artists that, you know, were very... But the point is that Liverpool Artists, we was a community of self-supporting artists, you know, that we had a show in the Pentonville Gallery later. But that was quite important. And, you know, that I think artists need, you know, we're not individuals that we led to believe, that we are part of some sort of broader thing and you do need that mutual support to keep going really because it's not easy I mean I've been fortunate I guess like Keith that I spent most of my life teaching which I've you know has been important um, but without that you know uh, there's one Um, 
I don't know, actually. I mean, funny if when I was invited to be in this show and to do the talk, I sort of uh, did the classic thing. I, I couldn't remember half of the stuff. So I, I went back to check out various CVs I've got on the computer, and they all started in 1995. I deleted almost like 15 years, you know, cause to update them. So I've had to trawl through, you know. In fact, one of the things, all oh, this is, these are copies of talks uh, or notes I, I gave in the 80s. So I had to piece together what I did in the 1980s. So I'm not so sure, uh, I mean, you know, about things like that, to be honest. But Keith, you you and other members of the Black Art Group are, are have been and continue to rethink the history of of what you were doing. Um, are you aware, like, how conscious or you know, what impact does that consciousness have on of of the fact that there are younger generations looking up to you? Looking up, well, uh, I suppose the. Um... <laughs> I'm just going to jump back to, to a point which was made early, earlier about a void. Yeah. Because, um, uh, I mean, in a sense, and Marley Smith will disagree with me on this. <laughs> um, um, in the 1980s and the early 1980s, when, when and we were uh, young artists, um, there was a void in our knowledge mm -hmm. of art history, particularly the art history of other of other black artists who had come before, you know, the artists that had been working in the 1970s and 1960s. You know, there, there, there kind of was a lack of awareness of those particular histories, apart from Mark Arlene, who, who apparently interviewed them all <laughs> at the same time. Uh, and um, in a sense, I think, I think there, are, there are fewer... Um, I suppose excuses for that in amongst young artists because because um, younger artists now can be can access a particular density of, of of his history around whatever their interest is, and so you know when I speak with um, young artists, you know it's always about how they are engaging with the histories of practices which they're interested in, you know, and um, this idea that your practice d doesn't come out of a, a vacuum but you have to. Know, look at the historical the historical precedence of your practice. I don't know if that answers your question, but what was your but question? Then? It was just whether or not you you were conscious of of your significance to a younger generation. Well, I don't. Um, I mean, significance is to write it too broadly. However, I do feel that um, that as artists, as cultural um, practitioners, um, it is quite important that we. We kind of try to order or leave our history in an orderly fashion, mm -hmm. in something you know that we make at, at least things um, as accessible as we can for other people to look at. Yeah. You know, it's not assuming that they will, but it's there. Yeah. And so, like if, if art historians or younger artists or whatever want to access stuff, mm -hmm. they can. You know, they may read the histories in ways which are completely unexpected to us. Well, I think that is actually part of that. And it's quite a wonderful that history thing. writing process and, that and rewriting. Yeah. And that goes to the point of exactly what you've been talking about today: that history is ever evolving, <coughs> um, changing according to <coughs> the person reading and reinterpreting. Yes, very much so. Very much so. On that note, I think we I should um, thank <laughs> Pete and Keith. Give him a round of applause.